Hello, and welcome to Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I'll be your reader today. I want to say a little salute, by the way, to Don Johnson for suggesting today's book. And by the way, you'll notice on the website that there is now an email address that you can use to uh, let us know of any particular books you might like to suggest or any comments you may have had on a past reading. So I welcome you to communicate. And thank you, Don. <laughs> let me start with a quote this morning. Um, and the quote is from, I'm not going to tell you, you already know probably, writers are a little below the clowns and a little above the trained seals, <laughs> which I think is a great quote. I'm not sure if all writers agree with that, but that was written by today's writer. Uh, so with that thought in mind, uh, and as a salute to his notoriously fun sense of humor, more than likely today's guest author would not have minded my corny start to this introduction. Here we go with corn. What do grapes, mice, and a place called Eden have in common? All right, please don't roll your eyes. It's not that corny, okay. But surely it's an echo of the man of whom it was said at the time of being awarded in 1962, the Nobel Prize for Literature, for his realistic and imaginative writings, combining as they do sympathetic humor and keen social perception. So what do grapes, mice, and a place called Eden have in common? Yes, of course. Yes, of course, the great giant of American letters, Mr. John Steinbeck. And today is our day to focus our spotlight on the great Mr. Steinbeck. The grapes of wrath of mice and men east of Eden, plus the red pony, the winter of our discontent, Cannery Row, Tortilla Flat, The Pearl. Well, enough said, you know the picture. From Salinas, California, and the region around the city of Monterey, California, in 1902, along his trail through local ranches with migrant workers, through the Dust Bowl of Oklahoma and the Great Depression, his books, essays, plays, and short stories tell the tales of struggle, mostly among low-income Americans, and often from his well-known anti-capitalist slant. From Cup of Gold in 1927 through to The Grapes of Wrath in 1939, which justly won for him the Pulitzer Prize, to America and Americans in 1966, and finally to his last book, started in 1952, but sadly unfinished at the time of his death in 1968 at the early age of 66. A book with a very unlikely title, The Acts of King Arthur and His Noble Knights. Mm, that would be an interesting book to read from a man like John Steinbeck. Another quote from Mr. Steinbeck, strength, and success, they are above morality, above criticism. It seems then that it is not what we do, but how you do it and what you call it. Hmm. Certainly thought provoking there, isn't it? For today's reading, I have selected a journey on the lighter side with John Steinbeck. Travels with Charlie in Search of America was published in 1962 and captured his own joyful adventures, rediscovering America at age 58, eight years before his passing. And I'm going to let him tell the tale of how this came about. Travels with Charlie in Search of America. 
by Mr. John Steinbeck. When I was very young and the urge to be someplace else was on me, I was assured by mature people that maturity would cure this itch. When years described me as mature, the remedy prescribed was middle age. In middle age, I was assured that greater age would calm my fever. And now that I'm 58, perhaps senility will do the job. Nothing has worked. Four hoarse blasts of a ship's whistle still raise the hair on my neck and set my feet to tapping. The sound of a jet, an engine warming up, even the clopping of shod hooves on pavement brings on the ancient shudder, the dry mouth and vacant eye, the hot palms and the churn of stomach high up, up, up under the rib cage. In other words, <laughs> I don't improve. In further words, once a bum, always a bum. I fear the disease is incurable. I set this matter down not to instruct others, but to inform myself. When the virus of restlessness begins to take possession of a wayward man and the road away from here seems broad and straight and sweet, the victim must find first in himself a good and sufficient reason for going. This is the practical bum is not difficult. He has a built-in garden of reasons to choose from. Next, he must plan his trip in time and space, choose a direction and a destination. And last, he must implement the journey, how to go, what to take, how long to stay. This part of the process is invariable and immortal. I set it down only so that newcomers to bumdom, like teenagers in new hatched skin, will not think they invented it. Once a journey is designed, equipped, and put in process, a new factor enters and takes over. A trip, a safari, an exploration, is an entity different from all other journeys. It has personality, temperament, individuality, uniqueness. A journey is a person in itself. No two are alike. And all plans, safeguards, policing, and coercion are fruitless. We find after years of struggle that we do not take a trip. A trip takes us. Tour masters. Schedules, reservations, brass bound and inevitable, dash themselves to wreckage on the personality of the trip. Only when this is recognized can the blown in the glass bum relax and go along with it. Only then do the frustrations fall away. In this, a journey is like a marriage the certain way to be wrong is to think you control it. Huh, I feel better now, having said this, although only those who have experienced it will understand it. My plan was clear, concise, and reasonable, I think. For many years, I have traveled in many parts of the world. In America, I live in New York, or dip into Chicago or San Francisco, but New York is no more America than Paris is France, or London is England. Thus I discovered that I did not know my own country. I, an American writer writing about America, was working from memory and the memory is at best a faulty, warpy reservoir. I had not heard the speech of America, smelled the grass and trees and sewage, seen its hills and water, its color and quality of light. I knew the changes, 
only from books and newspapers. But more than this, I had not felt the country for 25 years. In short, I was writing of something I did not know about. And it seems to me that in a so-called writer, this is criminal. My memories were distorted by 25 intervening years. Once I traveled about in an old bakery wagon, double doored rattler and a mattress on the floor. I stopped where people stopped or gathered. I listened and looked and felt, and in the process had a picture of my country, the accuracy of which was impaired only by my own shortcomings. So it was that I determined to look again, to try to rediscover this monster land. Otherwise, in writing, I could not tell the small diagnostic truths, which are the foundations of the larger truth. One sharp difficulty presented itself. In the intervening 25 years, my name had become reasonably well known. And it has been my experience that when people have heard of you favorably or not, they change. They become, through shyness or the other qualities that publicity inspires, something they are not under ordinary circumstances. This being so, my trip demanded that I leave my name and my identity at home. Now, I had to be peripatetic eyes and ears, a kind of moving gelatin plate. I could not sign hotel registers, meet people I knew, interview others, or even ask searching questions. Furthermore, two or more people disturbed the ecologic complex of an area. I had to go alone and I had to be self-contained, a kind of casual turtle carrying his house on his back. With all this in mind, I wrote to the head office of a great corporation which manufactures trucks. I specified my purpose and my needs. I wanted a three quarter ton pickup truck capable of going anywhere under possibly rigorous conditions. And on the truck, I wanted a little house built like the cabin of a small boat. A trailer is difficult to maneuver on mountain roads, is impossible and often illegal to park and is subject to many restrictions. In due time, specifications came through for a tough, fast, comfortable vehicle, mounting a camp atop, a little house with double bed, a four burner stove, a heater, refrigerator and lights operating on butane, a chemical toilet, closet space, storage space, windows screened against insects. Exactly what I wanted. I was delighted in the summer to my little fishing place at Sag Harbor near the end of Long Island where it was delivered. Although I didn't want to start before Labor Day when the nation settles back to normal living, I did want to get used to my turtle shell to equip it and learn it. It arrived in August, a beautiful thing, powerful and yet lithe. It was almost as easy to handle as a passenger car. And because my planned trip had aroused some satiric remarks among my friends, I named it Rosinante, which you will remember was the name of Don Quixote's horse. I was advised that the name Rosinante painted on the side of my truck in 16th century Spanish script would cause curiosity and inquiry in some places. I do not know how many people recognize the name, but surely no one ever asked about it. It was said that my New York license plates would arouse interest and perhaps questions since they were the only outward identifying marks I had. And so they did, perhaps 20 or 30 times in the whole trip. But such contacts followed an invariable pattern. 
somewhat as follows. Local man, New York, huh? Me, yup, local man. I was there in 1938, or was it 39? Alice, was it 38 or 39 we went to New York? Oh, Alice, it was 36, I remember, because it was the year Alfred died, local man. Anyway, I hated it. Wouldn't live there if you paid me. <laughs> There was some genuine worry about my traveling alone, open to attack, robbery, assault. It is well known that our roads are dangerous, and here I admit I had senseless qualms. It is some years since I've been alone, nameless, friendless, without any of the safety one gets from family, friends, uh, and accomplices. There is no reality in the danger. It's just a a very lonely, helpless feeling at first, a kind of desolate feeling. For this reason, I took one companion on my journey, an old French gentleman poodle known as Charlie. Actually, his name is Charles Le Chien. He was born in Bercy on the outskirts of Paris and trained in France. And while he knows a little poodle English, he responds quickly only to commands in French. Otherwise, he has to translate, and that slows him down. He is a very big poodle of a color called bleu. And he is blue when he is clean. Charlie is a born diplomat. He prefers negotiation to fighting, and properly so, since he is a very bad at fighting. Only once in his 10 years has he been in trouble, when he met a dog who refused to negotiate. Charlie lost a piece of his ear at that time, but he is a good watchdog, has a roar like a lion designed to conceal from night wandering strangers the fact that he couldn't bite his way out of a cornet de papier. He's a good friend and traveling companion and would tra rather travel about anything, about than anything he can imagine. If it occurs at length in this account, it is because he contributed much to the trip. A dog, particularly an exotic like Charlie, is a bond between strangers. Many conversations en route began with, what degree of a dog is that? The techniques of opening conversation are universal. I knew long ago and rediscovered that the best way to attract attention, help, and conversation is to be lost. Well, a man will cheerfully devote several hours of his time giving wrong directions to a total stranger who claims to be lost. Under the big oak trees of my place at Sag Harbor sat Rosinante, handsome and self-contained, and neighbors came to visit. Some neighbors didn't even know we had. I saw in their eyes something I was to see over and over in every part of the country a burning desire to go, to move, to get underway, any place, any place away from any here. They spoke quietly of how they wanted to go someday, to move about free and unanchored, not towards something, but away from something. I saw this look and heard this yearning everywhere in every state I visited. Nearly every American hungers to move. One small boy, about 13 years old, came back every day. <laughs> he stood apart shyly and looked at Rosinante. He peered at the door, even lay on the ground and studied the heavy duty springs. He was a silent, ubiquitous small boy even came at night to stare at Rosinante. 
After a week, he could stand it no longer. His words wrestled their way, hell-bent through his shyness. He said, if you'll take me along with you, why, I'll do everything. I'll, I'll cook, I'll wash all the dishes, and, and do all the work, and I'll take care of you. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, I knew his longing. I wish I could, I said, but the school board and your parents and lots of others say I can't. I'll do anything, he said, and I believe he would. I don't think he ever gave up until I drove away without him. He had the dream I'd had all my life, and there is no cure. Equipping Rosinante was a long and pleasant process. I took far too many things, but I didn't know what I would find. Tools for emergency, tow lines, a small block and tackle, a trenching tool and crowbar, tools for making and fixing and improvising. Then there were emergency foods. I would be late in the Northwest and caught by snow. I prepared for at least a week of emergency. Water was easy. Rosinante carried a 30 gallon tank. Canned goods, shotgun shells, rifle cartridges, toolboxes, and far too many clothes, blankets and pillows, and many too many shoes and boots, padded nylon sub-zero underwear, plastic dishes and cups and a plastic dishpan, a spare tank of bottled gas. Well, <laughs> the overloaded spring sighed and settled lower and lower. I judge now that I carried about four times too much of everything. Now, Charlie is a mind reading dog. There have been many trips in his lifetime and often he has to be left at home. He knows we are going long before the suitcases come out and he paces and worries and whines and goes into a state of mild hysteria, old as he is. During the weeks of preparation, he was underfoot the whole time and made a damn nuisance of himself. He took to hiding in the truck, creeping in and trying to make himself very small. Now, in long range planning for a trip, I think there is a private conviction that it won't happen. As the day approached, my warm bed and comfortable house grew increasingly desirable and my dear wife incalculably precious. To give these up for three months for the terrors of the uncomfortable and unknown seemed crazy. I didn't want to go. Something had to happen to forbid my going, but it didn't. I could get sick, of course, but that was one of my main but secret reasons for going at all. During the previous winter, I had become rather seriously ill with one of those carefully named difficulties, which are the whispers of approaching age. When I came out of it, I received the usual lecture about slowing up, losing weight, limiting the cholesterol intake. It happens to many men, and I think doctors have memorized the litany. It had happened to so many of my friends. The lecture ends, slow down. You're not as young as you once were. And I had seen so many begin to pack their lives in cotton wool, smother their impulses, hood their passions, and gradually retire from their manhood into a kind of spiritual and physical semi-invalidism. In this, they are encouraged by wives and relatives, and it's such a sweet trap. I knew that 10 or 12,000 miles driving a truck alone and unattended over every kind of road would be hard work. But to me, it represented the antidote for the poison of the professional sick 
man. And in my own life, I am not willing to trade quality for quantity. If this projected journey should prove too much, then it was time to go anyway. I saw too many men delay their exits with a sickly slow reluctance to leave the stage. It's bad theater as well as bad living. I am very fortunate in having a wife who likes being a woman, which means that she likes men, not elderly babies. Although this last foundation for the journey was never discussed, I'm sure she understood it. The morning came, a bright one with a tawny look of autumn in the sunlight. My wife and I parted very quickly since both of us hate goodbyes and neither one of us wanted to be left with the other had gone. She gunned her motor and exploded away for New York City and I, with Charlie beside me, drove Rosinante to the Shelter Island Ferry, then to the second ferry to Greenport, and a third one from Orient Point to the coast of Connecticut across Long Island Sound. For I wanted to avoid New York traffic and get well on my way. And I confess to a feeling of gray desolation. For weeks I had studied maps, large scale and small, but maps are not reality to me. They can be tyrants. I know people who are so immersed in roadmaps that they never see the countryside they pass through. And others who having traced a route are held to it as though held by wheels to rails. I pulled Rosinante into a small picnic area maintained by the state of Connecticut and got out my book of maps. And suddenly the United States became huge beyond belief and impossible ever to cross. I wondered how in hell I'd got myself mixed up in a project that couldn't be carried out. So it was now as I looked at the bright colored projection of monster America. The leaves of the trees about the campground were thick and heavy, no longer growing, but hanging limp and waiting for the first frost to whip them with color and the second to drive them to the earth and terminate their year. Charlie is a tall dog. As he sat in the seat beside me, his head was almost as high as mine. He put his nose close to my ear and said, Pst. he is the only dog I ever knew who could pronounce the consonant F. This is because his front teeth are crooked, a tragedy that keeps him out of dog shows. Because his upper front teeth slightly engage his lower lip, Charlie can pronounce F. The word usually means he would like to salute a bush or a tree. I opened the cab door and let him out and he went about his ceremony. He doesn't have to think about it to do it well. It is my experience that in some areas, Charlie is more intelligent than I am, but in others, he is abysmally ignorant. He can't read, can't drive a car and has no grasp of mathematics. But in his own field of endeavor, which he was now practicing, the slow imperial smelling over an anointing of every era. He has no peer. Of course, his horizons are limited, but how wide are mine? We drove on in the late afternoon of autumn, heading north. My route north to Vermont and then east to New Hampshire in the White Mountains and route to Maine. The roadside stands were piled with golden pumpkins and russet squashes and baskets of red apples so crisp and sweet that they seemed to explode with juice when I bit into them. I bought apples and a gallon jug of fresh squeezed cider. 
I believe that everyone along the highway sells moccasins and deerskin gloves. And those who don't sell goat milk candy. Until then, I had not seen the factory outlet stores in the open country selling shoes and clothes. The villages are the prettiest, I guess, in the whole nation, neat and white painted and not counting the motels and tourist courts, unchanged for a <laughs> hundred years, except for traffic and paved streets. The climate changed quickly to cold and the trees burst into color. The reds and yellows you can't believe. It isn't only color, but a glowing as though their leaves gobbled the light of the autumn sun and then released it slowly. There's a quality of fire in these colors. I got high in the mountains before dusk. A, a sign beside a stream offered fresh eggs for sale. So I drove up a farm road and bought some eggs and asked permission to camp beside the stream and offered to pay. The farmer was a spare man with what we think of as a Yankee face and the flat vowels we consider Yankee pronunciation. No need to pay, he said. The land's not working. <laughs> Charlie likes to get up early and he likes me to get up early too. And why shouldn't he? Right after his breakfast, he goes back to sleep. Over the years, he has developed a number of innocent appearing ways to get me up. He can shake himself and his collar loud enough to wake the dead. If that doesn't work, he gets a sneezing fit. But perhaps his most irritating method is to sit quietly beside the bed and stare into my face with a sweet and unforgiving look on his face. I come out of deep sleep with the feeling of being looked at, but I have learned to keep my eyes tight shut. If I even blink, he sneezes and stretches and that night's sleep is over for me. Often the war of wills goes on for quite a while. I squinching my eyes shut and he forgiving me, but he merely always wins. He liked traveling so much he wanted to get started early. And early for Charlie is the first tempering of darkness with the dawn. I soon discovered that if a wayfaring stranger wishes to eavesdrop on a local population, the places for him to slip in and hold his peace are bars and churches. But some New England towns don't have bars and churches only on Sunday. A good alternative is the roadside restaurant where men gather for breakfast before going to work or going hunting. To find these places uninhabited, one must get up very early. And there is a drawback even to this. Early rising men not only do not talk much to strangers, they barely talk to one another. Breakfast conversation is limited to a series of laconic grunts. The natural New England taciturnity reaches its glorious perfection at breakfast. I fed Charlie, gave him a limited promenade and hit the road. An icy mist covered the hills and froze on my windshield. I'm not normally a breakfast eater, but here I had to be, or I wouldn't see anybody unless I stopped for gas. At the first lighted roadside restaurant, I pulled in and took my seat at the counter. The customers were folded over their coffee cups like ferns. I wormed conversation, normal conversation is as follows. Waitress, same, customer, yep. Waitress, cold enough for you? Customer, yep. 10 minutes, 
waitress. Refill, customer. Yep. This is a really talkative conversation. Some reduce it to burp and others do not answer at all. An early morning waitress in New England leads a lonely life, but I soon learned that if I tried to inject life and gaiety into her job with a blithe remark, she dropped her eyes and answered, yup, or mmm. Still, I did not feel that there was, I did feel that there was some kind of communication, but I can't say what it was. As I went farther and farther north and it got colder, I was aware of more and more advertising for Florida real estate. And with the approach of the long and bitter winter, I could see why Florida is a golden word. As I went along, I found that more and more people lusted toward Florida and that thousands had moved there and more thousands wanted to and would. The advertising, with a side look at federal communications, made few claims except for the fact that the land they were selling was in Florida. Some of them went out on a limb and promised that it was above tide level. But that didn't matter. The very name Florida gave the message of warmth and ease and comfort. It was irresistible. I drove as slowly as custom and the impatient law permitted. That's the only way to see anything. Every few miles, the states provided places to rest off the road, sheltered places sometimes near dark streams. There were painted oil drums for garbage and picnic tables, and sometimes fireplaces or, uh, or barbecue pits. At intervals, I drove Rosinante off the road and let Charlie out to smell over the register of previous guests. Then I would heat my coffee and sit comfortably on my back step and contemplate wood and water and the quick rising mountains with crowns of conifers and the fir trees high up dusted with snow. In the stream beside the resting place, I saw a trout rise from the dark water of a pool and make outflowing silver rings. And Charlie saw it too and waded in and got wet, the fool. He never thinks of the future. I stepped into Rosinante to bring out my poor little mite of garbage for the oil drum, two empty cans. I had eaten one from and Charlie from the other. Eventually, Charlie climbed back into Rosinante and a cloud closed the sun and put a chill in the air. I find myself driving faster than I wanted to and it began to rain, a cold steel rain. I didn't give the lovely villages the attention they deserved. And before long, I had crossed into Maine and continued eastward. I wish any two states could get together on a speed limit. Just about the time you get used to 50 miles an hour, you cross a straight line and it's 65. I wonder why they can't settle down and agree. However, in one matter, all states agree. Each one admits it is the finest of all and announces that fact in huge letters as you cross the state line. Among nearly 40, I didn't see a single state that hadn't a good word to say for itself. It seemed a little indelicate. It might be better to let visitors find out for themselves, but maybe we wouldn't if it weren't drawn to our attention. <laughs> ah, here we go. Before I started my tour, I had known that at intervals of every few days, I would have to stop at auto courts or motels, not so much to sleep, but for the sake of hot, luxurious bathing. 
So in Rosinante, I heated water in a tea kettle and took sponge baths, but bathing in a bucket delivers little cleanliness and no pleasure whatsoever. A deep dish sit down in a tub with scalding water is a pure joy. Not far outside of Bangor, Bangor, I stopped at an auto court and rented a room. It wasn't expensive. The sign said, greatly reduced winter rates. It was immaculate. Everything was done in plastic. Yes, the floors, the curtain, tabletops of stainless, harmless, burnless plastic, lampshades of plastic, only the bedding and the towels were of a natural material. I went to the small restaurant, run in conjunction. It was all plastic too. The table linen, the butter dish, the sugar and crackers were wrapped in cellophane. It was early evening and I was the only customer. Even the waitress wore a sponge off apron. She wasn't happy, but then she wasn't unhappy. She wasn't anything, but I didn't believe anything is a nothing. There has to be something inside, if only to keep the skin from collapsing. This vacant eye, this damask cheek dusted like a donut with plastic powder, has to have a memory or, or a dream. On a chance, I asked, how soon are you going to Florida? Next week, she said, listlessly. Then something stirred in that aching void. Say, how do you know I'm going? Read your mind, I guess. She looked at my beard. You with a show? <laughs> no. Like it down there? Oh, sure, I go every year. Lots of waitress jobs in the winter. What do you do down there? I mean, for fun. Oh, nothing. Just fool around. A few fish or swim. Not much. I just fool around. I don't like that sand. Makes me itch. Make good money? It's a cheap crowd. Cheap? Oh, they rather spend it on booze. Then what? Then tips. Just the same here with the summer people, cheap. Strange how one person can saturate a room with vitality, with excitement. Then there are others like this dame who is one of them who can drain off energy and joy, can suck pleasure dry and gets no sustenance from it. Such people spread a grayness in the air about them. I've been driving a long time and perhaps my energy was low and my resistance was down, but she got me. <laughs> I felt so blue and miserable, I wanted to crawl into a plastic cover and die. What a date she must be. <laughs> what a lover. I tried to imagine that last and uh, couldn't. For a moment, I considered giving her a $5 tip, but I knew that wouldn't happen. She wouldn't be glad. She'd just think I was crazy. I went back to my clean little room. I don't ever drink alone. It's not much fun. And I don't think I will until I'm an alcoholic. But this night I got a bottle of vodka from my stores and took it to my cell. In the bathroom, two water tumblers were sealed in cellophane sacks with the words, these glasses are sterilized for your protection. Across the toilet seat, a strip of paper bore the message, this seat has been sterilized with ultraviolet light for your protection. Everyone was protecting me and it was horrible. 
I tore the glasses from their covers. I violated the toilet seat with my foot. I poured half a tumbler of vodka and drank it, and then another. Then I lay deep in hot water in the tub, and I was utterly miserable, and nothing was good anywhere on the planet. Charlie caught it for me, from me, but he's a gallant dog. He came into the bathroom, and that old fool played with the plastic bath mat like a puppy. What strength of character, what a friend. Then he rushed to the door and barked as though I were being invaded. And if I hadn't been for all that plastic, he might have succeeded. If Charlie hadn't shaken and bounced and said, Pfft, I might've forgotten that every night he gets two dog biscuits and a walk to clear his head. I put on clean clothes and went out with him into the star rattled night and the Aurora Borealis was out. Oh, I've seen it only a few times in my life. It hung and moved with majesty in folds like an infinite traveler upstage in an infinite theater in colors of rose and lavender and purple. It moved and pulsed against the night and the frost shop and stars shone through it what a thing to see at a time when I needed it so badly. I wondered for a moment whether I should grab that waitress and kick her behind out to look at it, but I didn't dare. She could make eternity and infinity melt and run through your fingers. The air had a sweet burn of frost and Charlie moving ahead saluted in detail a whole row of clipped privet and it steamed as he went along. When he came back, he was pleased and glad for me. I gave him three dog biscuits, rumpled up the sterile bed and went out to sleep in Rosinante. It is not unlike me that in heading toward the West, I should travel East. That was always been my tendency. I was going to Deer Isle for a very good reason. My longtime friend and associate, Elizabeth Otis, has been going to Deer Isle every year. When she speaks of it, she gets an otherworldly look in her eyes and becomes completely inarticulate. When I planned my trip, she said, of course, you'll stop at Deer Isle. It's, uh, it's out of the way. <laughs> Nonsense, she said in a tone I know very well. I gathered from her voice and manner that if I didn't go to Deer Isle, I'd better never show my face in New York again. She then telephoned Miss Eleanor Brace, with whom she always stays, and that was that. I was committed. All I knew about Deer Isle was that there was nothing you could say about it. But if I didn't go, I was crazy. Also, Miss Brace was waiting for me. I got thoroughly lost in Bangor, what with traffic and trucks and horns blaring and lights changing. I, I vaguely remembered that I should be on US Highway 1, and I found it and drove 10 miles in the wrong direction, back toward New York. <sighs> I'd be given written directions on how to go, detailed directions, but have you ever noticed that instructions from one who knows the country get you more lost than you are, even when they are articulate and accurate? I also got lost in Ellsworth, which I am told is impossible, then the roads narrowed and the lumber trucks roared past me. I was lost almost all day, even though I found Blue Hill and Sedgwick. Late in the despairing afternoon, I stopped my truck and approached a majestic Maine state trooper. What a man he was, granite as any quarried about Portland. 
a perfect model for some future equestrian statue. I wonder if future heroes will be carved in marble jeeps or patrol cars. I seem to be lost, officer. I wonder if you could direct me. Where is it you want to go? I'm trying to get to Deer Isle. He looked at me closely, and when he was satisfied that I wasn't joking, he swung up on his hips and pointed across a small stretch of open water, and he didn't bother to speak. Is that it? He nodded from up and down and left his head down. Uh, well, uh, how do I get there? I've always heard that Maine people are rather taciturn, but for this candidate for Mount Rushmore, to point twice in an afternoon was to be unbearably talkative. He swung his chin in a small arc in that direction I'd been traveling. In the afternoon had not been advancing, I would have tried for another word from him, even if I doomed to failure. Thank you, I said, and sounded to myself as though I rattled on forever. First, there was a high iron bridge, as high arched as a rainbow. And after a bit, a low stone bridge built in the shape of an S curve. And I was on Deer Isle. My written direction said that I must take every right road branch that turned right and the word every was underlined. I climbed a hill and turned right into pine woods on a smaller road and turned right on a very narrow road and turned right again on wheel tracks on pine needles. It is so easy once you've been over it, I couldn't believe I would find the place, but in a hundred yards, there was the great old house of Miss Eleanor Brace. And there she was to welcome me. I let Charlie out and suddenly an angry streak of gray burned across the clearing of the pines and bucketed into the house. That was George. He didn't welcome me and he particularly didn't welcome Charlie. I never did rightly see George, but his sulking presence was everywhere. For George is an old gray cat who has accumulated a hatred of people and things so intense that even hidden upstairs, he communicates his prayer that you will go away. If the bomb should fall and wipe out every living thing except Miss Brace, George would be happy. That's the way he would design a world if it were up to him. And he could never know that Charlie's interest in him was purely courteous. If he did, he would be hurt in his misanthropy for Charlie has no interest in cats whatsoever, even for chasing purposes. We didn't give George any trouble because for two nights we stayed in Rosinante, but I am told that when guests sleep in the house, George goes into the pine woods and watches from afar, grumbling his dissatisfaction and pouring out his dislike. Miss Brace admits that for the purposes of a cat, whatever they are, George is worthless. He is in good company. He is not sympathetic, and he has little aesthetic value. Perhaps he catches mice and rats, I suggested helpfully. Never, said Miss Brace. Wouldn't think of it. And do you want to know something? George is a girl. I had to restrain Charlie because the unseen presence of George was everywhere. In a more enlightened day when witches and familiars were better understood, George would have found his, or rather her, end in a bonfire. 
because if ever there was a familiar and envoy of the devil, a consorter with evil spirits, George is it. One doesn't have to be sensitive to feel the strangeness of Deer Isle. And if people who have been going there for many years cannot describe it, what can I do after two days? It is an island that nestles like a suckling against the breast of Maine. But there are many of those. The sheltered darkling water seems to suck up light, but I've seen that before. The pine woods rustle and the wind cries over open country that is like Dartmoor. Stonington, Deer Isle's chief town, does not look like an American town at all in place or in architecture. Its houses are layered down in the calm water of the bay. This town very closely resembles Lyme Regis on the coast of Dorset. And I would willingly bet that its founding settlers came from Dorset or Somerset or even Cornwall. Main speech is very like that in West Country England and double vowels pronounced as they are in Anglo-Saxon, but the resemblance is doubly strong on Deer Isle. And the coastal people below the Bristol Channel are secret people and perhaps magic people. There's art behind their eyes, hidden away so deep that perhaps even they do not know they have it. And that same thing is so in Deer Islers. To put it plainly, this isle is like Avalon. It must disappear when you are not there. Or take for advantage the mystery of the coon cats. Huge, tailless cats with gray coats barred with black which is why they are called coon cats. They are wild, they live in the woods and are very fierce. Once in a while, a native brings in a kitten and raises it and it is a pleasure to him, almost an honor. But coon cats are rarely even approximately tame. You take a chance of being raked or bitten all the time. These cats are obviously of Manx origin and even interbreeding with tame cats that contribute taillessness. Hmm. The story is that the great ancestors of the coon cats were brought by some ship's captain and that they soon went wild. But I wonder where they get their size. They are twice as big as any Manx cat I ever saw. Could it be that they bred with bobcat or lynx? I don't know. Nobody knows. Down by the Stonington Harbor, the summer boats were being pulled up for storage. And not only here, but in other inlets nearby are very large lobster pounds crawling with those dark shelled Maine lobsters from the dark water, which are the best lobsters in the world. Miss Brace ordered up three, not more than a pound and a half, she said. And that night their excellence was demonstrated beyond a doubt. There are no lobsters like this, simply boiled, no fancy sauces, only melted butter and lemon. They have no equals anywhere. Even shipped or flown alive away from their dark homes, they lose something. At a wonderful store in Stonington, half hardware store and half ship's Chandler, I bought a kerosene lamp with a tin reflector for Rossinante. I had the fear that I might somewhere run out of butane gas and how would I read in bed without it? I screwed the lamp bra bra bracket onto the wall over my bed and trimmed the wick to make a golden butterfly of flame. And often on my trip, I use it for warmth and color as well as light. It was exactly the same lamp that was in all the rooms at the ranch where I was a child and no pleasanter light was ever designed. Although old timers say that whale oil makes a nicer flame. 
I have demonstrated that I can't describe Deer Isle. Houses had a snow beaten look and many were crushed and deserted, driven to earth by the winters. Except in the town, there was evidence of a population which had once lived there and farmed and had its being and had been driven out. The forests were marching back and where warm farm wagons once had been, only the big logging trucks rumbled along and the game had come back. Two deer strayed on the roads and there were marks of bears. Maine seemed to stretch on endlessly. I felt as Perry must have when he approached what he thought was the North Pole. But I wanted to see a rustic county, the big northern county of Maine. There are three great potato raising sections. Idaho, Suffolk County on Long Island, and a rustic Maine. Lots of people have talked about a rustic county, but i had never met anyone who had actually been there. I had been told that the crop is harvested by Canucks from Canada who flood over the border at harvest time. My way went end endlessly through forest country and past many lakes, not yet frozen. As often as I could, I chose the small wood roads and they are not conducive to speed. The temperature lifted and it rained endlessly and the forests wept. Charlie never got dry and smelled as though he were mildewed. The sky was the color of wet gray aluminum and there was no indication on the translucent shield where the sun might be, so I couldn't tell directions. On a curving road, I might have been traveling east or south or west instead of the north I wanted. That old fake about the moss growing on the north sides of trees lied to me when I was a Boy Scout. Moss grows on the shady side and that may be any side. I determined to buy a compass in the next town, but there wasn't any next town on the road I was traveling. The darkness crept down and the rain drummed on the steel roof of the cab and the windshield wipers sobbed their arcs. Tall, dark trees lined the road, crowding the gravel. It seemed hours since I had passed a car or a house or a store, for this was the country gone back to forest. A desolate loneliness settled upon me, almost frightening. Loneliness. Charlie, wet and shivering, curled up in his corner of the seat and offered no companionship. I pulled in between the approach to a concrete bridge and couldn't find a level place on the sloping roadside. Even the cabin was dismal and damp. I turned the gas mantle high, lit the kerosene lamp and lighted two burners on my stove to drive the loneliness away. The rain drummed on the metal roof. Nothing in my stock of food looked edible. The darkness fell and the trees moved closer. Over the rain drums, I seemed to hear voices though a crowd of people muttered and mumbled off stage. Charlie was restless. He didn't bark an alarm, but he growled and whined uneasily, which is very unlike him. And he didn't eat his supper and he left his water dish untouched. And that by a dog who drinks his weight in water every day and needs to because of the outgo. I succumbed utterly to my desolation, made two peanut butter sandwiches and went to bed and wrote long letters home passing my loneliness around. Then the rain stopped falling and the trees dripped and I helped to spawn a school of secret dangers. Oh, we can populate the dark with horrors. Even we who think ourselves informed and sure, believing nothing we cannot measure or weigh. I knew beyond all doubt that the dark things crowding in on me either did not exist or were not dangerous to me and still, 
I was afraid. I thought how terrible the nights must have been in a time when men knew the things were there and were deadly. But no, that's wrong. If I knew they were there, I would have weapons against them. Charms, prayers, and some kind of alliance with forces equally strong, but on my side, knowing they were not there, made my defensiveness against them and perhaps more afraid. <laughs> Lying in my bed under the weeping night, I did my best to read, to take my mind out of misery. But while my eyes moved on the lines, I listened to the night. On the edge of sleep, a new sound jerked me awake. The sound of footsteps. Hmm. I thought moving stealthily on gravel. On the bed beside me, I had a flashlight two feet long made for coon hunters. It throws a powerful beam at least a mile. I got up from the bed and lifted my 3030 carbine from the wall and listened again near the door of Rocinante. And I heard the steps come closer. Then Charlie roared his warning and I opened the door and sprayed the road with light. It was a man in boots and a yellow oilskin. The light pinned him still. What do you want? I called. He must have been startled. It took him a moment to answer. I want to go home. I live up the road. And now I felt the whole silly thing. The ridiculous pattern that had piled up layer on layer. Ah, uh, would you like a cup of coffee or a drink? No, it's late. If you'll take that light out of my face, I'll get along. Right, I, I, I snapped off the light and he disappeared. But his voice in passing said, come to think of it, what are you doing here? Camping, I said, just camped for the night. And I went to sleep the moment I hit the bed. The sun was up when I awakened and the world was remade and shining. There are so many worlds as there are kinds of days. And as an opal changes its colors and its fire to match the nature of the day, so do I. The night fears and loneliness are so far gone that I could hardly remember them. Even Rocinante, dirty and pine needle covered as she was, seemed to leap over the road with joy. Now there were open fields among the lakes and forests, fields with the crumbly, friable soil potatoes love Trucks with flatbeds loaded with empty potato barrels moved on the roads and the mechanical potato digger turned up long windrows of pale skin tubers. I wanted to go to the roof tree of Maine to start my trip before turning west. It seemed to give the journey a design and everything in the world must have design and the human mind rejects it. But in addition, it must have purpose or the human conscious shies away from it. As it turned out, I saw almost more potatoes than I needed to see. I saw mountains of potatoes, oceans, more potatoes than you would think the world's population could possibly consume in a hundred years. Hmm. <laughs> On such a trip as mine, so much there is to see or to think about that event and thoughts set down as they occur would royal and star like a slow cooking minestrone. There are many people whose joy it is to lavish more attention on the streets of colored paper than on the colored land rolling by. I have listened to accounts of such travelers in which every road number was remembered, every mileage recalled and every little countryside discovered Another kind of traveler requires to know in terms of maps exactly where he is pinpointed every moment, as though there was some kind of safety in black and red lines, in dotted indications and in squirming blue of lakes and the shadings that indicate mountains. It is not so with me. I was born lost and take no pleasure in being found, nor much identification from shapes which symbolized continents and states. Besides, 
roads change, increase, are widened or abandoned so often in our country that one must buy roadmaps like daily newspapers. But since I know the passions of the map fires, I can report that I move north in Maine roughly parallel to US Highway 1 through Halton, Mars Hill, Presque Isle, Caribou, Van Buren, turned westward, still on US 1, past Madawaska, Upper Frenchville and Fort Kent, and then went due south on State Highway 11 past Eagle Lake, Winterville, Portage, Squawpan, Massardis, Knowles Corner, Patton, Sherman, Grindstone, and so to Millinocket. Some years ago, I cannot report this too clearly because I have a map before me, but what I remember has no reference to the mem numbers and colored lines and squiggles. I have thrown this right routing in as a sop and shall not make a habit of it. What I remember are the long avenues in the frost, the farms and houses braced against the winter, the flat, laconic main speech and crossroads across stores where I stopped to buy supplies. The many deer that crossed the road on nimbling hooves and leaped like bounding rubber away from the passing Rosinante, the roaring lumber trucks. And always, I remember that this huge area had once been much more settled and was now abandoned to the creeping forest, the animals, the lumber camps and the cold. The big towns are getting bigger and the villages smaller. The Hamlet store, where the grocery, general, hardware, clothing, cannot compete with the supermarkets and the chain organizations. Our treasured and nostalgic picture of the village store, the Cracker Barrel store, where an informed yeomanry gather to express opinion and formulate the national character, is very rapidly disappearing. People who once held family fortresses against wind and weather, against scourges of first frost and drought and insect enemies, now cluster against the busy breast of the big town. The new American finds his challenge and his love in traffic choked streets, skies nestled in smog choking with the acids of industry, the screech of rubber and houses unleashed in against one another while the town lets wither a time and die. And this, as I found, is as true in Texas as in Maine. Clarendon yields to Amarillo just as surely as Stacyville, Maine blends its substance into Millinocket where the logs are ground up, the air smells of chemicals, the rivers are choked and poisoned and the streets swarm with this happy chirping breed. There is not offered in criticism, but only as observations. And I am sure that as all pendulums reverse their swing, so eventually will the swollen cities rupture like dehiscent wombs and disperse their children back to the countryside. This prophecy is underwritten by the tendency of the rich to do this already. Where the rich lead, the poor will follow or try to. Maine is just as long coming down as it is going up, <laughs> maybe longer. I could and should have gone to Baxter State Park, but I didn't. I had dawdled too long and it was getting cold and I had visions of Napoleon at Moscow and the Germans at Stalingrad. So I retreated smartly. Brownville Junction, Milo, Dover Foxcroft, Guilford, Bingham, Skowhegan, Mexico, Rumford, where I joined a road I had already traveled through the White Mountains. In the silver chill of a main afternoon, as I bucketed and lumbered over the pitted surface of a wood road, I saw four lady mooses 
moving with stately heaviness across my bow. As I came near, they broke into a heavy cushion trod. On an impulse, I pressed down the lever of the moose collar I had, and a bellow came out. The ladies, who were on the point of disappearing into the forest, heard the sound, stopped, turned, and then came for me with gathering speed and with what looked to me like romance in their eyes. But four romances, each weighing well over a thousand pounds, as much as I favor love in all aspects, I trod my accelerator and got the hell out of there fast. And I remembered a story of the great Fred Allen. His character was a main man telling of a moose hunt. I sat on a log and blew my moose call and waited. Then suddenly, I felt something like a warm bath mat on my neck and my head. Well, sir, it was a moose says licking me and there was a light of passion in her eyes. Did you shoot her? He was asked. No, sir. I went away from there fast, but I have often thought that somewhere in Maine, there's a moose with a broken heart. <laughs> and thus the end of John Steinbeck's travel through Maine. He does make it all the way around the country in this short, tiny little book. Uh, and there are great stories everywhere, great impressions, great observations of people, and especially great thoughts about changes, the changes that America saw in that 25 years that opened his eyes to another whole world. This was just a few years before he passed away, but I can just imagine the great books he would have written after age 86. So a great salute to a great man with many great stories, a great sense of humor, and a great heart for America. Thank you, John Steinbeck. And thank you for being with me here today, uh, for listening to this great tale. I hope you'll join me next week. As you know, St. Patrick's Day is coming up very quickly. So next week we are going to salute our Irish friends uh, the world around with a book by an Irish author, of course. And I have selected a book called The Heather Blazing, which sounds very inviting to me. It's written by a gentleman named Colum Toybean. Colum Toybean is uh, one of, gosh, uh, very popular authors for the last several years uh, and internationally, really. Uh, his name is spelled with few letters, but I took lessons to say this right today. So from this point forward, call him Toy Bean. I will say your name right and read your words next week. So please come join me next week for a salute to Ireland and a salute to St. Patrick's Day. Again, thank you so much for being with me. I hope you have a great week ahead. We have more sunshine than we have gray skies. Uh, and above all, of course, I hope you remain safe. Thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs>